Hello and good evening. Welcome to the Sophia Novel Oration Lecture Series. Today's session is the third one in this series of online lectures, and we have a wonderful speaker talking to us about the Nobel Prize in Literature 2020. My name is Elvin Susan John, and I teach at the Department of English here at Sophia College. Now I invite Dr. Sister Ananda Amrit Mehal, Principal of our College and from the Department of English, for the introductory remarks. Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this third round of the Nobel orations this year. This is a tradition that started some 19 years ago, and it has been sustained. It was started by the Life Science Department, and initially it was conducted by them. And it focused on developments in physiology and medicine that were being awarded the Nobel Prize. And uh, the idea behind this entire exercise was to make these dimensions of, you know, like extremely rarefied levels of academia accessible to our students, accessible to people like all of us who are here today waiting to listen, who are interested in the way in which the edifices of knowledge develop, and yet perhaps don't have either the vocabulary or the conceptual framework to follow through in each of the various disciplines. So we used to get experts in initially only in physiology and medicine, but over a period of time it expanded to include the other disciplines as well, as well as the implications of the Peace Prize and so on, and make it accessible to our students so that somewhere there is also that inspirational level where you feel, oh my goodness, this is what the human mind and the human spirit is capable of. And that has been sustained over the last 19 years and this year, for the first time, we have been able to expand this initiative to include all the Nobel Prizes. So this, the third in our series this year, looks at the Nobel Prize in Literature, which was awarded to Louise Gluck. And uh, we're ever so grateful to Dr. Sonia Nair, who is the head of the Department of English at All Saints College in Tiruvananthapuram, that she has agreed to come in here and share with us something of her expertise. You know, one wonderful thing about this entire pandemic and lockdown and all this is that suddenly it has expanded our world even while it shrank our world. Because on Zoom, we can tap into a person's academics, experts from across the world and certainly from across our country. So, Dr. Nair, we are ever so happy that you have agreed to be with us today and a very, very warm welcome to you and a very warm welcome to every one of the students and other participants who are following this on YouTube. I'm sure this is going to be a most enriching and enlightening session. Thank you so much. Thank you, sister. Uh, now, Ms. Jihasa Vajrarajani, HOD, Department of English, will brief brief us about this lecture series. A very good evening to all of you. Sister Ananda has already taken us through how the Sophia Nobel Oration Lecture Series have been an important part of the academic life of Sophia College. Over the years, these lectures have fostered dialogue between eminent scholars and students on a wide range of subjects. This year, the event has expanded to include all six categories of Nobel Prizes. This is therefore the first ever lecture on the works of a recipient of a Nobel Prize in Literature. The Nobel Committee has historically honored ideas and insights, not without its share of controversy, that have helped us better understand ourselves, uh, ideas that have mitigated suffering, and shown us what it is to be curious, just, and empathetic human beings, whether they be theories of economics, the works of writers, or the cure for diseases. 
the creation as well as enjoyment of art whether it be literature music dance they say is an instinct for thousands and thousands of years we have been creating art to comment on life to better understand it and perhaps most importantly to enjoy it art sustains us art saves us more often than not from ourselves art is knowledge we invite you to celebrate this interconnectedness of knowledge systems through our event i warmly welcome all of you and especially dr sonia nair once again to this program thank you jaha sir now before we introduce you to our speaker just a very quick word about the format of the session our resource person will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes which will be followed by an interactive session with the audience for about 15 to 20 minutes uh you can please post your questions in the chat box on our youtube channel and uh, try to make your questions brief so that we can accommodate as many questions as we possibly can uh now our uh, second year student ms pritika sachdeva will formally introduce and welcome dr sonia to the stage good evening ma'am uh good evening everyone sonia j nayar is head and assistant professor at the pg and research department of english all saints college trivandrum her doctoral dissertation was on the transgender festivals of south india she is a creative writer and poet and is put and is putting final touches to the biography of a trans person from kerala the first of its kind in english she has presented papers at various national and international seminars and conferences in kerala as well as throughout india her areas of interest include gender studies colonial botanical studies film studies and area studies she is also the editor of samyuktapoetry.com her works have appeared in the ekl review the borderless journal the shimmer spring anthology and rewriting human imagination an anthology published by iasc and the center for digital humanities she is currently also working on a collection of new poems welcome ma'am it is our pleasure to have you with us today um i now like to hand over the floor to you ma'am thank you very much everybody at sophia college for giving me this wonderful opportunity i am extremely happy and honored to be here with you this evening and i hope that uh, we will have a very productive session ahead now my lecture is titled the nobel everydayness of louis gluck now um, you know i had uh, come across uh, louis's poems uh, i suppose well over a decade and then um, you know in the general course of life and events and so on you tend to sometimes forget what you read but then at a very crucial juncture in life i came across this particular uh, poem by her it's called utopia and i would like to read out uh, the thing when the train stops the woman said you must get on it but how will i know the child asked is it the right train it will be the right train said the woman because it is the right time a train approached the station clouds of grayish smoke streamed from the chimney how terrified i am the child thinks clutching the yellow tulips she will give to her grandmother her hair has been tightly braided to withstand the journey then without a word she gets on the train from which a strange sound comes not in a language like the one she speaks something more like a moan or a cry this is a, a very very defining uh, sort of you know verse that comes from her uh, collection called faithful and virtuous knight okay and uh, you know when i read this i thought about how it is that you know she has folded very very deeply psychological experience into something so succinct something so evocative as this and since then you know the everydayness of 
of Louise Kluck's poems began to kind of get to me. I, I began thinking about it over and over again. And uh, that's when I happened to uh, write a post for Samyukta Poetry, where I was talking about her everydayness and how it is so easily identifiable. And this coincided with the time that uh, she was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. And it is this everyday, uh, you know, the resonance with the everyday that did give, you know, uh, lead to her being awarded the prize. Now, we might all be wondering what's so special about the everyday, because as we all know, the everyday occurs literally every day. Hmm? Uh, it's, it's seen as routine, repetitive, banal, boring, vanilla. That's how people look at the everyday. General presentations of everyday in literature, in film, uh, you know, in advertisements, etc., all talk about it as, as a rather staid, as a rather, you know, uh, life or soul sucking sort of an occurrence, you know, you, you brush your teeth every day, but then that particular day when you try something different, a different toothpaste or a different toothbrush, the entire world just lights up in, I don't know, a, a number of different colors. Okay, so, uh, but, you know, the, the sudden rush of a rebellion that, you know, spreads across the epidermis of a nation, then that is seen as a break from the everyday. And we realize that the sporadic is valued, it is loved, it is remembered, cherished, written, you know, sung about. Okay, so uh, this, this is how the everyday has often been conceptualized, and therefore it has been undervalued. Okay, now, but the sort of everydays that, you know, uh, the way that everydays have been assessed by theoreticians such as Michel de Certo or Agnes Heller or Schoter, etc., kind of indicates the fact that the everyday is just as, if not even more valuable than these sporadic rushes that we were talking about just now. Because it is this constant production as well as reproduction of of systems, okay, which can, uh, you know, in fact, point out, uh, point to where we are going, or, you know, where it is that we are headed towards, or what exactly is going wrong. So the banal, the everyday, the, the staid, the regular is needed in order to understand the, the possible ways in which we can bear it. Okay? The, the difference or the distinct can be understood only if the same exists or is allowed to propagate itself. And, you know, uh, this means that the change comes from that which we say, okay, rather. The change comes from the sameness of the same. And, uh, you know, the, the patterns or the modes of resistance or even the interpretation of resistance comes from our, you know, countless processes of the everyday. This is why there are varied forms of resistances across the world. This is why there is no one sort of resistance. Uh, the, the modalities, the language, the semantics of resistance vary as per the everyday practices that, that nations, people, communities, individuals take up. Okay, and uh, you know, as is famously said, tomorrow is already today. You know, that, that's something very deeply philosophical, but at the same time, interestingly simple. And if we want to look at the way that, you know, every days affect individuals, all we need to do is uh, we just need to take a look at Sherlock Holmes, the character, okay, where, uh, you know, the, the, the numbness caused by every day is, is so much to take that he has to dull his senses. But interestingly, it is these very every days and the way that, you know, people go on with their seemingly normal existences that have given him some of the greatest similarities. So this is the rather, you know, ambivalent attitude that people have towards the everyday. What exactly is it and what does it do for us? Okay, and I think in these pandemic times uh, when, you know, uh, nations were under lockdown and so on, the everyday began to weigh upon the minds and consciousnesses of people all over the world. Okay, and the ways that one could deal with it. Uh, I, I think that has thrown up a number of interesting possibilities. So it is interesting to note that, you know, uh, the, the everyday is not seen as being political enough, or sometimes it is seen as though it, it lacks in depth, okay? And there has been, in fact, a lot of criticism that has been leveled against uh, the selection of uh, Louise Gluck for this prize, the Nobel Prize in Literature, 
because they have been calling her a safe uh, you know, choice. Uh, and interestingly, the other choices that they had in the past years, like uh, you know, Peter Hanka, did result in a great deal of controversy. And uh, uh, of course, Olga Tokarczuk was beyond reproach. But then you know, uh, there was this conscious decision to want to move away from a uh, Eurocentric uh, you know, Nobel into a more diversified uh, kind of a scenario. And, uh, you know, while people often kept saying that there were so many other people that we could have, you know, kind of given it to, uh, it could have gone to Ngugi Kyongo or it could have gone to Charles Simic and so on. But uh, this particular choice of, of this particular individual, I think is symptomatic of the time. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's why, you know, even she mentioned who knew and it is too much here already. And I, I don't know how it, this happened. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, considering the way that the world has uh, kind of evolved or has begun expressing itself the better part of the last decade, and in particular in these last two, three years, uh, kind of points that the time was actually right, you know, to quote her from, uh, you know, her own poem, the time was actually right for somebody like uh, Louise to have won this prize. Because, you know, take a look at the Booker Prizes of, of the last years. It's been a very interesting choice. You know, some of them were rather political choices also. You had test, but at the same time, you also had a novel like Girl, Woman, and Other by, by Bernadine Evaristo, okay, which was extremely political, but at the same time, deeply, deeply personal, okay? It, it talked about a, a, a certain world that was constituted not just by ideologies, but by individuals who were living within as well as without those ideologies, inside as well as outside those ideologies, okay? It was showing a world that was in a, in a state of great flux and, and the fissures, the cracks, and the people who fell through those cracks. Those, those you know, individual, uh, how do I say, the granules of individuality that shone through, I, I suppose, those were what appealed to people all over the world. You had uh, the choice last year, uh, uh, you know, Shugi Bain, uh, again, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, sorry, the Booker Prize winner. And then the Man Booker International Prize that went to Discomfort of an Evening, which was, I, I suppose, an individual's, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the deepest levels of an individual's mind that was laid out there, the, the depictions of grief, the depictions of confusion, the, the way that narratives unfolded at multiple layers and levels, the combinations and permutations that went into what we prize as family, okay, the, uh, what we call the fundamental social unit of, of society and similar things, uh, which is family, the way that, you know, a, a family has these tiny cogs and wheels within, and the way that, you know, these unspool and, and the way that they transform individuals, I suppose this, uh, these narratives that came about from, um, you know, strange parts of the world, from, from strange segments of the world, talking about rather uh, unfamiliar occupations, unfamiliar lifestyles, all of these things point to the fact that, you know, the world is actually looking for the sameness of the same. Okay? Uh, that's how I read it. Because, you know, uh, people say that, look at the world around you. It is sleep. Everything is political. There are people protesting out on the streets. They, they are in a state of great ferment and unrest. There are movements that are being, uh, you know, uh, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, and, uh, you know, those kind of extremely, uh, how do I say, uh, fragmented, you know, identities that are being celebrated out there. Okay. But then if you think about it, hasn't it always been the case where the world has always been in a state of turmoil, where there is always somebody who is not the way that, you know, things have transpired in their part of the world and they are looking to change it. Has there ever been a time in this world where history has been a, a still lake rather than a raging ocean? There's never been a time like that. But what is kind of interesting about, you know, the contemporary times is the way that the individual has been foregrounded, okay? The, the way that human beings have been talked about, discussed, 
uh, let's say, tweaked and tinkered with, and the possibilities of the human mind and the human body have, have been, uh, you know, the, the talking point in recent times. Uh, you know, those, the spaces that the body occupies, the, the presences and the absences of these bodies and the in-betweenness of our identities from being monoliths, from being homogenized chunks of, of consciousness. We have managed to, you know, fragment. We have managed to shift tectonic plates that lie within the, the very foundation of what we call our identities. Today, there are newer ways of perceiving an individual. There are newer pronouns uh, 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 you know, in, by which people can be referred to. There are newer ways in which people define themselves, not just by their nationalities, but by their sexualities, their subsexualities, their regionalisms, all contributing to what I would uh, say is the, the federalism of the individual. Okay, what goes into making you has become diversified. Uh, it has it has multiplied, and there is there is a sense of polyphony which is being celebrated. Okay, so what is essentially today a subculture, you know, kind of uh, is, is refusing to be suppressed. Okay, now uh, as we all know about the ways in which the laws of sexuality in this country have have changed have been modified, you know, uh, uh, but then at the same time, we cannot ignore the rule, uh, the, the, the kind of a role that economics has played in this entire thing, that, you know, transactions have played in this entire thing. But that's a subject for another day altogether. But here, you know, we, we have to understand that the individual is created like never before. So, you know, the, the anxieties of modernities, the anxieties of sexualities, the interface between man and machine, and the dystopias of despair. Okay, uh, the, the stories, those, those mini narratives that are asking to be, you know, written, that are trying to find their way and their place in the larger uh, narrative of the world, all of these things are contributing to a, a very, very interesting, uh, a very beautiful way of, of perceiving the world around us, of giving voice, see? That I think is, is beautiful. And of course, the role that culture and histories play in, in constituting us and the roles that we play in constituting cultures and histories. And uh, uh, as far as histories are concerned, as we all know, they are being rewritten at a very alarming rate. Okay, and parallel histories or micro histories that I mentioned earlier are emerging as very, very strong challengers or contenders. So these are the, the kind of, you know, uh, challenges before an individual when they look in the mirror at themselves or when they, uh, you know, kind of perceive themselves through the eyes of other people. Okay, how am I being perceived? you know, how, how is somebody decoding me? Those questions have begun to make a very serious impact upon the way that identities are structured, identities are presented, and identities are interpreted, okay? So uh, the, the weight of political histories must certainly not undermine the significance of personal histories, the ways in which all of these coalesce into what we call identity. Okay, so, uh, you know, if, if you think about it, uh, there is this uh, segment from uh, Louise, uh, from a collection of poems called House on Marshland. And in that she talks uh, from the point of view of Gretel, you know, from Hansel and Gretel. It's titled Gretel in Darkness. She says, this is the world we wanted. All who would have seen us dead are dead. I hear the witch's cry break in the moonlight through a sheet of sugar. God rewards. Her tongue shrivels into gas. Now, far from women's arms and memory of women in our father's hut, we sleep, are never hungry. Why do I not forget? My father bars the door, bars harm from this house, and it is years. No one remembers. Even you, my brother, summer afternoons, you look at me as though you meant to leave, as though it never happened. But I, 
I see armed furs, the spires of that gleaming kiln. Nights, I turn to you to hold me, but you're not there. Am I alone? Spice hiss in the stillness. Hansel, we are there still, and it is real, real, that black forest and the fire in earnest. Okay. This is a, a very, very excoriating portrayal of trauma, of memory. Okay. And if this is not identifiable with uh, an individual who has experienced trauma, then I don't know what will. See, these are the aspects of, of Gluck's poetry that has uh, kind of appealed to people all over the world with 12 collections of poetry to her name, uh, numerous essays and, you know, critical uh, reviews and so on. Uh, you know, she has made this great impact on the psyche of America, writing about individuals, writing about, you know, families, about people and the mythologies that have gone into creating not just nations, but also selves and, you know, both political, personal and religious selves. Okay. And she has been awarded every conceivable prize in, in uh, the U.S., and she was also their poet laureate for some time. And uh, I, I suppose that, you know, this kind of, of reward that comes in uh, does not come in very lightly. Okay, There has to be a narrative that goes beyond, behind it. And as far as I'm concerned, I think it is her consistency. The consistency with which she has built up a, a, a body of poems that if you take in a sequential order, refer to or look like the life and individual or personal development of a human being. You know, her first collection of poems is titled First Born, okay? And she has often jokingly referred, uh, you know, said that, uh, you know, please don't look at my first collection of poems, look at my later collection of poems, because that's where I think I have grown as a poet, I've grown as an individual. And, uh, you know, there are uh, some interesting um, nuances in her poetry where there are uh, over uh, different collections, there are poems that are titled Thanksgiving. And each Thanksgiving poem is different from the other. Where, you know, one, she talks about a family celebration. In another point, at another point, she talks about this very same family, but who are, you know, evolved, who are changed, who, who seem sharper, who seem meaner. But at the same time, there is an undercurrent of connectivity, uh, a need for security that only each of these people can give each other. Okay, now in a, in a very insecure kind of a world, in a world that is so fast moving, one needs these moorings, is what she's kind of trying to say without making it way too apparent. Okay, and uh, the, the way that, you know, she has used the myths, the, the stories of Persephone, the stories of Dido, the stories of Orpheo, uh, you know, Eurydice and so on, in order to script very, very contemporary narratives of betrayal of anger, of ruination, of violence. It is extremely impressive. You know, in um, a, a collection that is titled, one second, please. Yeah, uh, that is uh, titled The Triumph of Achilles. You know, she talks about how Achilles and Patroclus were, were so much alike. Okay, you know, she says that uh, uh, they, they were such good friends, they were such great friends but uh, there is always a sense of inequality that uh, exists in these friendships. That one friend will always be slightly better than the other. One friend who will slightly be more glamorous than the other, who is noticed more than the other, who, you know, and this becomes apparent through the legends or the way that people speak about them. And, you know, uh, people always would prefer to be Achilles. But in the last segment of that poem, she says, what, you know, after Patroclus is dead, and she's talking about this from the point of view of Achilles, so which means that the triumph of Achilles is said in a rather ironic fashion, okay? She says, what were the Greek ships on fire compared to this loss, the loss of Patroclus? In his tent, Achilles grieved with his whole being, and the gods saw he was a man already dead, a victim of the part that loved the part that was mortal, see? And the poem is titled, The Triumph of Achilles. Now in a foreword uh, that she had written for another poet, you know, uh, she mentions that 
somehow the the idea of irony has uh, you know kind of slipped away from poetry that most people somehow consider irony to be a weapon okay that has come to define this particular century and instead what they have done also is that they have forgotten the role that nature or garden can play in the work of a poet okay so you know she has kind of foregrounded the idea of the garden and the 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 way in which irony is dealt with as a, a weapon as an identifying trope of the 21st century okay and that i found very interesting because rarely you know do we find in in poetry people actually talking about gardens like they matter gardens as a site uh, of the real world see they might talk about it in romantic terms uh, but here what what louise has done is that she has spoken about as a casual violence you know as a place where there is a, a sort of odd sort of sensuality one that is rooted in in resentment one that is rooted in anger one that that is capable of inflicting violence and the theme of violence is something that you know uh, runs through her poetry right from the beginning all the way up to the end uh, and if you ask me what sort of violence it's not just sexual violence or physical violence it is also the way that you know the mind perpetrates violence upon itself and those around it see uh, like uh, you know she has this poem called uh, widows which is from a collection called ararat that uh, you know interestingly she calls one of her most prosaic uh, you know colloquial kind of uh, collections uh, in that i'm just going to read the first few lines of it you know she talks about her mother and her aunt who are playing cards both of them are widows and uh, you know uh, the aunt has been widowed for a longer time than the mother and you know the narrator says my mother is playing cards with my aunt spite and malice the family pastime the game my grandmother taught all her daughters okay but you know you think that this is this is going to be one of those biting poems about the kind of women that you know uh, lived in her family but interestingly the poem then dissolves very beautifully into the whole idea of uh, examining the progression of grief you know where the aunt wins at the game of cards before i mean because the, she has been widowed for a longer time as uh, compared to the mother okay so uh, you see that you know the way that uh, grief has been symbolized in the whole uh, you know process of the art of playing cards how you transform grief into an art into a game into a, an intense sense of consciousness so where grief is supposed to ennoble you make you into something better than you are you know a kind of mellow down your your primal tendencies here you know she refers to them as spite and malice uh, he calls them called those the family pastime understand so and and she also points to the fact that this has been handed down to the women down the ages you know it comes from the grandmother all right and this this rather tension filled uh, continuum that exists between mother and daughter you know finds a great deal of of resonance in in her uh, in her hellenistic poems you know where she talks about uh, persephone you know there are uh, there is persephone in two versions of the poem in the same book where you know has died and you know her, her mother is grief stricken at the same time the mother is circling the earth and then you know she wonders about how to you know kind of take uh, negotiate this this death with the uh, son in law you know so to speak and uh, you know how grief can be or death can be changed into a, a weapon of negotiation okay now in another one you know she talks about how the sexuality of persephone is regarded or considered by the mother and uh, you know the mother wonders about the she was too beautiful she was you know uh, too sensual now why did she have to leave my body see that's the question that the mother asks so then you have a competitor you have a protector you have the very complicated relationship that exists between mothers and their daughters between women you know between generations 
Okay, and the whole idea of violence that pervades this entire thing. The act of permitting violence to be committed upon the body of the daughter. Okay, something that, uh, you know, mothers would easily identify with, you know, when, when we lend a bit of thought to it. So, uh, you know, the, these connections that she brings about, the rawness, okay, uh, the, the whole idea of, of the earth being connected uh, to an individual in the larger scheme of things, how women and the earth are connected, okay, and how, you know, she reinterprets these myths. Like, of course, we have had a number of times where, you know, the, uh, the, the story of, you know, uh, Ulysses coming back to his wife in Ithaca has been talked about, written about, all of that is there. But, uh, you know, uh, this uh, 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 Louise Gluck talks about it from the point of view of Telemachus, okay, talks about it uh, from the point of view of an omniscient narrator, you know, uh, says uh, about how, you know, uh, men are all the same, they think in a certain way, they believe that once they have arrived, all the problems just go away. And then, you know, it's not just that she talks from the point of view of women, she also talks from the point of view of the men, okay. Like in uh, Medolens, there is this segment called, a poem called Parable of the Hostages, okay. And uh, there she talks about how the Greek warriors are sitting on the beach and they are, they are wondering about having to go back you know, to their, to their horrendous island, they'd rather stay here in Troy and take what is there, you know, uh, for the, for the uh, taking. And, you know, because it's this whole idea of living on the edge, the danger, uh, you know, what you can take away from this place, that whole sensation of being alive on a different dimension, on a different, you know, hill altogether, rather than being a plateau. Okay. But then, of course, they also have to miss their wives. They also have to think about getting back home because the thing do understand. And then the end, you know, refers obliquely to the the, the story of the way that you know Ulysses uh, Ulysses spent his journey. You know, where they say, how could the Greeks know that they were hostage already? Who once delays the journey is already enthralled. How could they know? that of their small number, some would be held forever by the dreams of pleasure, some by sleep, some by music. Okay, it is so beautifully explanatory, okay, that if you have already delayed, the act has already happened in your head, okay? So this deep understanding that she has of, of the, you know, the, the innate despair, the, the, the sense of, of complexity that governs the human psyche. That is very remarkable. And, uh, you know, she says that, you know, she has written poems with the same titles over the years because a person is allowed to revisit their views and change them. You know, she has uh, a lot of poems on something as uh, thematically simple as children coming home. Okay, where she talks about, you know, her, her son coming home, her niece coming home from school. She talks about her sister coming home from school, the way that the mother looks upon the sister who comes home from school, as opposed to the poet who wants to make a huge fuss, because otherwise she fears there is going to be no home. Okay, so those ordinary fears of ordinary individuals, these are the ideas that she foregrounds. Okay. Now, on, on a very theoretical level, you know, we can we can say that she incorporates all of these, you know, when you think about it, um, they incorporate elements from French feminist thought, the whole idea of, you know, uh, psychoanalytic uh, perspectives of the way that women look upon their own bodies, the bodies of their fathers, the, the rather tension-filled connection that women have with their fathers. You know, in the poems on mourning and grief that she has written, there is this, this very, very in-depth kind of a connection that she shares with her father, the way that she remembers her father, even in the poem that I read out, she talks about how her father shut the house, prevented any harm from coming in. So the presence of that father figure as a, as a rather strong person, okay, these are the things that uh, are, are rather interesting. Now, as I have mentioned before, the concept of a, a spiritual self, a biological self, a physiological self, all of these things, you know, make her uh, a poet uh, who has come down the ages 
to become a very, very contemporary poet of the time. Because these are, you know, I wouldn't say that these are concerns that have emerged only now, but it is only now that we have been able speak about these things with perfect felicity, with more fluency, you know, without stammering at, at all the wrong places. Uh, this, this time more than ever, because uh, it's a time when we have been defining the self. We have been calling attention to the selves that exist within what we perceive to be the self. You know, the way that bodies are negotiated. So if you look at her poetry, you know, she doesn't make it very obvious that, you know, this is the, the sexualities that I want to talk about or indulge into those, you know, graphic narratives of, of hardcore physicalities. None of these things. Everything is subtle. Everything is beautifully mentioned, you know, and, uh, and through this, what she does is that she makes all of these things into symbols, into, uh, into motives. Like Aphrodite, um, I, I will not read many more. Uh, this, this is one of the last. Aphrodite, a woman exposed as rock has this advantage. She controls the harbor. Ultimately, men appear weary of the open. So terminates, they feel a story. In the beginning, longing. At the end, joy. In time, sorry, in the middle, Tedium. I'll go over that once again. In the beginning, longing. At the end, joy. In the middle, tedium. In time, the young wife naturally hardens. Drifting from her side in imagination, the man returns not to a drudge, but to the goddess he projects. On a hill, the armless figure welcomes the delinquent boat, her thighs cemented shut barring the fault in the rock okay it's it's admirable how you know she has factored in the presumptions of chastity the presumptions of sexual performances the the presumptions of absence of desire uh, you know outside of certain drawn boundaries it's it's beautiful Okay, when, when we read it and you try to absorb the meaning and when you juxtapose this against, you know, what she has written about Ulysses and, and you know, all of those that I talked about earlier, you realize that these are not just, you know, uh, poems that talk about you and me on a daily plane. These are poems that incorporate the nuances of, you know, performative politics, of political politics. Uh, uh, of, of sexual politics, you know, of, of national politics uh, in, a, in a very, very unobtrusive manner. And probably that is the reason why, you know, people have missed out on the nuances and they have criticized this as a safe choice. I wouldn't call her a safe choice at all. A timeless, but at the same time, a very fraught choice because, uh, you know, the 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 violence of the world has been so embedded, it has been so present in her works as to go beautifully unnoticed. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a great, uh, I would call it a prank, you know, that, that she has played by, by very, very carefully placing these things. Though if you watch her interviews online, you know, you would, you would know that she has a very, uh, not, uh, not a very pranky personality, but yeah, she does have her problems. Okay. And, uh, the persona, yes, I should mention that also. The persona that pervades her poems uh, is something of a, of a very, very, uh, a, a very strong nature, okay? Uh, but uh, it's a persona that is very secure in the knowledge of what it is speaking. The poet at no time that, you know, tries to put forward her cleverness or her accomplishments out there. So this level of security is also something of a poetic craft, I must say, because, you know, being a poet myself, uh, I, I can understand the struggles. Uh, I can't actually even begin to comprehend the struggles of, you know, not what, not sounding clever. Okay. Uh, uh, of, of trying not to sound clever at the cost, at, at, at the same time, trying to be clever. That it's a very complicated structured sentence as well. But, uh, you know, the, the ways in which the competencies the, the lack of competencies uh, and, uh, you know, the, the traditional and the anti-traditional have been presented uh, in, in, in perfect alignment 
you know, creates a, a rupture. Sometimes perfection has this tendency of, of creating very intricate, you know, capillary kind of, of ruptures, which percolate very deep into our consciousness. And that is what, uh, you know, Louise Gluck has also managed. And in fact, uh, now I would like to uh, just talk about uh, her citation. You know, um, the Nobel uh, citation says that in her poems, the self listens for what is left of its dreams and delusions. And nobody can be harder than she in confronting the illusions of the self. But even if Gluck would never deny the significance of the autobiographical background, she is not to be denied or regarded as a confessional poet. She seeks the universal, and in this, she takes inspiration from myths and classical motives present in most of her works. The voices of Dido, Persephone, and Eurydice, the abandoned, the punished, the betrayed, are masks for a self in transformation as personal as it is universally valid. So it's this universality of her experience that has been lauded, created and rewarded. Okay. Uh, now, uh, you know, at, at that point, I would like to, you know, also refer to her uh, influences, which are actually T.S. Eliot, okay, and uh, Emily Dickinson, uh, the most actually, as well as Keats, okay. Now, um, here, uh, you know, the, the way that uh, Emily Dickinson has talked about the self and the way that, you know, the self confides in itself is something that has fascinated her. And she has pointed it out in her acceptance speech as well, which ran into considerable amount of rough weather on account of the way in which she rather, uh, you know, uh, I suppose glibly just, just uh, appropriated the voice of uh, the child in the little black boy, understand, and kind of completely uh, ran over his experiences, you know, uh, kind of blanketed it and kind of made it her own. And uh, this this kind of, you know, at a time when America was or uh, still is in the throes of, of reclaiming black identities and celebrating black identities, it became a, a bit of a, a controversy. Okay. But anyway, uh, that being said, you know, she concludes her, her narrative with uh, the fact that her entire system of argument, okay, or her entire philosophy of poetry has rested on this idea of intimacy, okay, or, or collusion, to quote her, between the self and, of course, the writer as well as the listener or the reader. Okay, so her poetry is as much as it is about uh, her as it is about you and me. Okay, so it's that identifiability of those experiences that matter the most in, uh, in her poetry, you know. So uh, she says that that is the kind of art uh, uh, to which I was drawn. The voice or judgment of the collective is dangerous. Okay, so she's kind of foreshadowing it all. The precariousness of intimate speech adds to its power, the power of the reader through whose agency the voice is encouraged in its urgent plea or confidence. What happens to a poet of this type when the collective, instead of apparently exiling or ignoring him or her, applauds and elevates? I would say such a poet would feel threatened or outmaneuvered. Okay, and uh, then, you know, she goes on to say that uh, I believe that in awarding me with this prize, the Swedish Academy is choosing to honor the intimate private voice, which public utterance can sometimes augment or but replace. So in the words of Louise Gluck, the, the individual, that is the you and the me, we are here to stay just as we have been through the ages and we will be through the ages as well. Okay. So this is why my lecture is titled The Nobel Everydayness of Louise Gluck, because you know it, it's, it's from these everydays that she has structured an entire lifetime, an entire narrative uh, of, of, of humans, okay, of, of people, of you and me. And if you take her works together, they form the lifetime of a human being. Okay. So 
thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, we have been productive. I hand it over to the organizers. Thank you, Sonia. That was spectacular. And we hope to have a brilliant conversation around the talk. I'm going to hand things to our uh, student, Ms. Arushi Sinha, for practical reasons. And she has uh, curated some of the questions that have already come in. Uh, our audience, please continue to post your questions. Uh, all yours, Arushi. Thank you so much, Erwin, ma'am. And good evening, Dr. Sonia. Arushi here. We have opened the floor for questions. So uh, the first question is asked by Bhagya Lakshmi V, who asks, ma'am, you quoted one of Louise's works. What is one of your favorite works by her till date? Oh, uh, that is obviously uh, Aphrodite. I absolutely love it, uh, you know, on account of the way in which, you know, she has talked about female sexuality and the assumptions that are made about female sexuality. So Aphrodite. Okay. Uh, Alia Sachar asks, hello, ma'am, you spoke about the everydayness in the pre-COVID and COVID era, but how do you think we'll perceive the everydayness in the post-COVID era? Okay, for that, uh, Alia, we have to first be in the post-COVID era. We are not there. But if you have to project uh, your imagination, I would say that I think this is going to lead to uh, greater collaborations and open up more possibilities. But at the same time, we have to be in intensely conscious about the political implications of these things. You know, the way that it, it affects people who do not have the, the, the advantages that, that are taken for granted by a large segment of our society at this point of time. We have to look into the ways in which livelihoods and lives are affected, opportunities are affected. Already it is being said that, you know, all the benefits, the, the advantages that we had gained over the years uh, through uh, a number of programs like midday meals in schools, you know, the, the advances that we had made in the field of nutrition, all of these have been set back by decades. So, uh, logically, we are in for a, a time that, that requires a great deal of uh, understanding, a great deal of, I would say, enlightened thinking you know, uh, where, where we are able to talk to people and understand their difficulties and create solutions that are flexible, okay? Not just create formulaic solutions where one solution is supposed to fit everybody. We have to think outside the matrix. That's what I believe. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. Um, Padmashri asks, Ma'am, could you please comment on the use and treatment of mythology in Louise's works? You spoke of her work on Patroclus and Achilles. Yes. Uh, see, uh, she is uh, somebody who has used these myths to uh, uh, a wonderful extent, you know, uh, to talk about contemporary experiences, uh, particularly, as I told you, even in the Nobel citation, it's mentioned the stories of uh, betrayal, the stories of rape and ruination, uh, the stories of uh, uh, connections between mothers and daughters, etc., through the bodies of, of these women, through the bodies of men also, in fact, you know. And I suppose that uh, the whole, uh, you know, notion of universality, the element of universality that is present in her poems comes through the exercise, not just of the everyday or the family, but also comes through the exercise of these myths and the ways that she has perceived it, you know, because uh, look at uh, Persephone, I, I told you, there were a number of Persephone poems uh, that she has written. And in each of that, there are various ways of looking at the same incident, at the same story. Okay, there is one where, you know, Persephone is, is wondering about, uh, as she's being ravished, uh, you know, she's wondering about what exactly is happening to her and the incomprehensibility of the act of violence that is being perpetrated on her body. And this is something that, you know, uh, a number of times, I'm, I'm sorry if it's a trigger alert, uh, but a number of times that, you know, rape victims have mentioned uh, when, when, when they talk about what has happened to them during the, the time of the uh, assault, they are also wondering what is happening and why it is so. Okay. Um, Sayukta asks, um, good evening, ma'am. What is the role of aesthetics in politically inspired art? Yeah, see, that's um, uh, a short, but uh, a very, very um, deep question. 
you know often people feel that uh, when some uh, some sort of uh, let's say uh, work of art that is intensely political is presented it does not have to be very aesthetic you know you can always present facts and things as raw as they are without uh, including that element of aesthetics uh, often you know people have debated about the, the things or even the or uh, aesthetics in in resistance poetry for example okay uh, does it have to be beautiful can't it just be you know out there uh, sentences as they come to you but i think that you know uh, there is no harm in that what is the problem if you can make it beautiful if you can make it evocative it stays for that much longer a time you know think about all the poems of resistance that we have come across over the years you know even in these recent times they are intense be poetic you know i believe that all human beings have poetry at the core of their uh, heart okay it it forms a very very crucial element of their soul and it's it's just the matter of putting it across uh, uh, for it to awaken so i think that uh, uh, aesthetics has a huge role to play in in the poetics of politics that is something all of us should think about putting things out there for the sake of putting it um autoshi sigdar asks can you please tell us a little more about the university of individual existence as gluck is lauded for this aspect of her poetry university or universality universality sorry oh, i'm so sorry yeah so uh, that's exactly what uh, we have been uh, you know uh, basing our entire conversation on uh, right now the universality see uh, of course we have to understand that uh, even things like uh, universality have to be used in great consideration because uh, what is my universe is not your universe is not somebody else's universe okay but there are some common threads or common narratives that run through these uh, these experiences you know these uh, consciousnesses that uh, kind of make them identifiable so uh, when when we say that you know there is universality in her poetry it could just mean something as as atomic as as fundamental as the fact that she understands and speaks the language of assault that is perpetrated upon a female body that she can she can you know kind of understand and express in very few words the way that you know desire works okay the fact that uh, an act when it takes place in your head has then already happened in a sense of the term like the question of uh, the, the line on delay that i was reading you know if you have delayed then you're already you know not there anymore okay. so thank you thank you you had mentioned this one line about gluck's poetry where you said that it is as much about her as it is about you and me so based on that iman asks that she takes up sim- seemingly simple themes and experiences from her real life so can we see them as autobiographical that autobiographical elements in her poetry so could you please elaborate a little bit on that point yes definitely the aspects and elements of her own life you know her divorces the the love uh, uh, relationships that she's had the relationships that she's had with her family the people that she has come across uh, you know her her jewish background all of these things have it because you know christ has a, a very strong place in in her entire uh, multiverse you know and uh, you know she she talks about uh, the travails of christ and and what what he does uh, you know the the way that christ is presented as uh, essentially not just humanity but but also a thought process so yes definitely okay uh, we have mr paul asking did you intend the noble everydayness or the noble everydayness well it is both noble and nobel you know i thought i'll also do a bit of word play of my own so that's why because it's it's with the nobel prize that you know people began saying that it's so everyday it's so common place why but at the same time there is something noble about it also you know because the human spirit at the end of the day is rather noble it, it, at least it has the ability to be noble It's entirely up to us. Like the life of the liver depends upon the liver. <laughs> yes. Um, we have Nidhi asking, what is the role played by poetry in these COVID times? Oh, uh, in these COVID times, practically everybody is a poet. Okay. 
because like i said uh, we have it all at the at the core of our soul we are all poets so uh, somehow the whole solitude the the loneliness of the nights and probably the constricting presence of just having to you know uh, play ping pong you know in your family itself bounce from here to there and then there to here the the sheer uh, limits that you have to place upon yourself uh, probably opens up the sense of limitlessness towards the world so you start to observe better you start to see better and poetry is definitely uh, one of those you know balms that people have used you know to try and heal there have been n number of you know poetry collections that have uh, come out uh, during these covid times about the covid times there have been novels coming out uh, you know so uh, it's it's going to be one of those uh, times when you're going to be inundated with literature and with the uh, presence of online literature you know it has become quite easy to put a huge volume of work out there okay so we will take one last question which is by ann matthew while speaking of the everyday especially when louise gluck has set herself apart as a poet what would be her responsibility towards this generation of poets creatives and to the public look i think that uh, first of all uh, the, the way that you know she has created body, that itself uh, i think is quite relevant in the sense that it has shown what a poet needs apart from being incredibly creative a poet also needs something called staying power you cannot give up you just cannot give up and you also have to understand the fact that uh, just because you have written it doesn't mean that you cannot unwrite it rewrite it okay so that's another thing that she has shown us so just because you know you know you don't have to be like salman khan where if you have made a commitment you will not even listen to yourself you are always allowed to to go back and change it to say okay uh, i have that perspective now this is also my perspective understand so this uh, see the uh, and that way she is very apt for these times also like i was talking to you about the changing the the whole definition of boundaries you know making them more flexible more inclusive more uh, uh, let's say uh, you know uh, malleable huh? uh, that is something that i think her poetry uh, has already taught us so i think if if she has anything to say to the poets of today it is that keep at it and uh, don't be afraid to change yourself correct yourself okay thank you so much you have definitely given us a lot to think about So now on behalf of the Sophia Noble Oration Committee and the Department of English Sophia College I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to Dr Sonia for taking out the time and delivering an insightful talk on Louise Gluck and her work I would also like to thank our principal Dr Sister Ananda Amrit Mehar for her guidance we also acknowledge the support of Rosa for sponsoring the event thank you our lovely audience for attending the talk asking questions and their responses here is a gentle reminder for you all to fill the feedback form shared in the comment section the link to the feedback form will be active only for one hour thank you so much dr sonia and thank you so much everybody thank you very thank you all for listening in and uh, we will be back with the next lecture of the series on 13th february for a talk on the chemistry nobel 2020 at the same time Now all that remains for me is to thank our wonderful speaker uh, Dr Sonia for an evening filled with so many amazing things to think about thank you Dr Sonia and thank you all Are we?